Hello everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. If you're new here, hi, my name is Carly Gifford and I like true crime, like a lot of people. However, there are some people who aren't big fans of true crime. So basically all I'm trying to do is give you the Cliff Notes version of a lot of different cases and keep it short and sweet. So that way you just get the brunt of the crime and what happened and you can at least talk about it or know a little bit about it when it comes up in conversation. I finally figured out what I wanna call this podcast podcast and I think or I shouldn't say podcast because I'm not uploading it to like Apple podcast or Spotify podcast but um I am going to call it true crime courier I just kind of thought that had a nice ring to it and it was better than like true crime times or something like that because like those names are taken I really wanted to do 10 minute true crime but that is already a podcast so I couldn't do that I'm sorry if you do not like the name True Crime Courier, but that is just what I'm gonna go with. I feel like it's kind of basic and gives you a good idea of what these videos are going to be about. So jumping right into today's case, it's kind of a crazy one. This is the case of Israel Keys, which I just found out about him the other day, driving home from visiting one of my friends in college. He was mentioned in another podcast, so I looked him up and yeah, it's kind of a crazy story. There's a lot of details I'm gonna leave out because they're extremely gruesome and just kind of out of respect for the victims. I don't really wanna talk about it. I don't think that's, you know, very respectful, I guess. So Israel Keys was born in Cove, Utah on January 7th, 1978. He was the second of 10 kids born to Heidi and John Jeffrey Keys. His parents didn't believe in government interference, public schools, or modern medicine. When Keys was a toddler, his family left Utah for Colville, Washington. They lived isolated in the woods without heat or electricity. While in Washington, Keys' parents left the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, commonly known as LD or Mormonism and became fundamentalist Christians as well as joined a white supremacist church. And I believe fundamentalists are like the Duggars. They moved to Oregon in the late 1990s until finally settling close to an Amish community in Maine. Keys used to break into neighbors' homes and steal guns to use for hunting. He was an avid hunter and would kill anything with a heartbeat. He tortured animals, which is a behavior linked to psychopathy, which is also something that Jeffrey Dahmer did, and so did the last guy that I did a video on, but of course now I literally can't think of his name. After Keyes told his dad that he no longer shared their faith, he cut all ties to his son. Keyes did, however, remain close with his mother. Now, I've also heard that she cut ties with him as well, and they told their children, their other nine children, not to talk to him because they really looked up to him. I don't know which exactly it is, whether or not they fully, all members cut ties with him. I, I really don't know. I mean, it's differing no matter what you look up. In July of 1998, he joined the U.S. Army and did well as a soldier. He spent time in Egypt at Fort Hood in Texas and Fort Lewis in Washington. After a honorable discharge in July 2001, he lived on the Maca Reservation with the mother of his daughter. Now, I couldn't find her or her daughter's names, so I'm assuming that they want to stay anonymous. So, I mean, out of respect for them, I'm I'm not going to mention names. In the summer of 97 or 98, so right before he had enlisted, he allegedly committed a sexual assault on a teen girl who had been tubing down the Deschutes River in Maupin, Oregon. However, it wasn't his first sexual assault. He's targeted random people around the U.S. to avoid being detected with months of planning beforehand. He spent time around campgrounds and isolated locations. He claimed to only use guns when he had to, but he preferred strangulation, which it's said that he liked seeing his victims pass out, which is really disgusting. He says that he never killed children or parents of children, mainly because he was afraid that his daughter might find out about his crimes. Sir, if you're worried about that, maybe let's just like not murder people, you know? But police and FBI investigators were skeptical of him and suspect that he killed several teens or children. He is believed to have committed his first murders as a teenager between 96 and 97 in and around Colville. Julie Harris, a 12-year-old Special Olympics medalist in skiing, disappeared in 90. 
1986. Her remains were found a year later in a wooden area a few miles away. Cassie Emerson, another young girl from the Colville area, was reported missing after her mother's remains were discovered in their burned out trailer home in June 1997. Cassie's remains were found in 98, about 13 miles from her home. There were no arrests in either case. Keyes did not admit to killing either girl, but he did admit that his first act of arson was with the trailer. So we can just kind of assume he didn't. <laughs> When questioned by police, Keyes' one-time fiancé asked if he was responsible for killing the two Colville girls. So I'm kind of mm, feeling like it was kind of a Ted Bundy type situation. She was skeptical of him, but wasn't totally sure. Keyes admitted to investigators that he killed four people in Washington state and claims that he was the subject of an active investigation by the state police and the FBI. He did not have a felony criminal record in Washington, although he had been stopped on two occasions for minor driving related offenses. offenses. So all in all, he up until this point has killed 11 people like up until 2012 now we're gonna talk about the most disturbing murder that he committed and that murder has to do with Samantha Koenig Samantha worked at Common Grounds Coffee Shop in Anchorage, Alaska, which Keys had been scoping out, kind of scoping her out. Um, and I shouldn't say it wasn't like a coffee shop. I mean, it was, but also it was just a drive-through. It was one of those, like you don't actually go inside, you just do the drive-through. So a lot of times there's only one person working in those stands at a time. Now I think they're starting to wise up and put two people in. On February 12th, 2012, he kidnapped Koenig from the drive-thru using a revolver. He told her it's a robbery and ordered her to turn off the lights. Right after she complied, he bound her hands, jumped through the window, stuffed a handful of napkins in her mouth, and forced her out of the coffee stand and into his pickup. Keyes told Koenig that he only wanted to hold her for ransom in his backyard shed, which was a lie. As soon as Keyes took Koenig's debit card and cell phone, he didn't need her alive anymore. Around 2 a.m., he finally took her from his truck and moved her to his tool shed where he tied her up by the neck. Then, Keyes went inside to check on his daughter and girlfriend and make sure they were asleep. He poured himself a glass of wine and returned to the shed. Cause you know, I mean, sometimes when you kidnap people, you just need some wine to relax and unwind. After killing her, he went back inside his house and packed bags for himself and his daughter. Keyes had planned a two week Caribbean cruise for his family. It wasn't until the next day that Koenig had been reported missing. But when Keyes returned home from his vacation on February, February 17th, he decided to take Samantha Koenig's ransom photo and promise her parents that she would be unharmed if they gave him money. That day, according to Latin Times, he sewed Samantha Koenig's eyelids open with fishing line, braided her hair, and applied makeup to her face. Then, he propped her body against a wall, held out a current issue of the Alaska Daily News, and took a photo. This was the proof of life photo that he intended to use to prove she was unharmed. I'm not gonna show it, but if you have any desire to see this photo trust me it's on the internet louie what are you doing sweetie sorry my dog just walked in i think he wants to hear the story then on february 24th he texted her boyfriend from her phone and told him to look for a package in a local park there anchorage police found the photo and a note demanding that thirty thousand dollars be deposited into koenig's bank account her parents gladly paid him as reported by alaska public radio keys dismembered her body and disposed of the remains in a frozen lake just outside of palmer alaska to the north Within days of Samantha Koenig's parents' deposit into her account, her debit card began pinging, first in Anchorage, then in Arizona, then New Mexico, then Texas. The FBI quickly deduced that her abductor was traveling east along Interstate 10. By March 13th, a Texas state trooper in the town of Shepard spotted the car in a hotel parking lot. According to CBS, he waited for the owner to come out and followed until the car ex exceeded the speed limit, pulling keys over the second he did. And when he searched the car, the trooper found Koenig's ATM card, her cell phone, and the same disguise worn by the man captured on all the ATM cameras where Koenig's card had been used. Samantha's body Body wouldn't be discovered until April 2nd, a few days after Keyes confessed to his crimes. In May 2012, Keyes tried to escape from a courtroom after breaking his leg irons during a routine hearing. Fortunately, his escape attempt was unsuccessful and authorities restrained him again. On December 2nd, 2012, Israel Keyes managed to conceal a razor blade in his jail cell at the Anchorage Correctional Complex in Alaska, which he used to take his own life. So unfortunately, Samantha's family never got 
the closure that they deserved that because he took the easy way out and they never got to see him actually like in prison prison like for good so that unfortunately is the story of israel keys i found this one to be incredibly interesting i hope that you guys did as well please leave a comment down below if you guys have any cases that you would like me to cover um give my video a thumbs up it really helps boost it out into the algorithm which is ever changing and i just really want my videos to get viewed so if you don't mind doing that and maybe subscribing uh thank you guys so much for watching but that is it for me today if you want come back tomorrow for another true crime courier video. Bye guys.